we're live back at the Coverage Your Podcast. I have my guest this week is Rick Ty from NFS. We're going to be talking flood. Uh, we're going to be talking natural catastrophes and that side of the business, which uh, it was funny because uh, before Rick and I started, it's a kind of ironic. Um, I'm in flood and I never talk about it. So uh, in full disclosure, um, Rick is with a separate company. And so, yeah, there might be some overlap between what his company does and what my company does, but uh, we're both sort of in the same field and we might be bumping elbows here or there. Rick, welcome to sure, the Coming Through Podcast. Yes, welcome, Nick, and good afternoon. And thank you for having me. I'm yes, very excited to be here. Of course. Uh, near the, this conversation, very near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, it's my, my feelings about flood and just natural catastrophes is that human beings just really struggle trying to understand, um, you know, things that have low probability of occurrence, but a potentially high severity, which is Correct. really hard to, um, really get their hands around. So I think we're going to be spending a lot of a time, a lot of our time, uh, in this particular episode talking about that, but. I always start by allowing my guests to introduce themselves properly. So Rick Ty, tell us a little bit about you and NFS. Sure. Um, so I am the managing director of growth strategy uh, for NFS. And, and I've been with the company since January of 2020, started January 2nd, actually. And I have 30 years of experience, past experience, um, in um, an organization that focused on the property and casualty space. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a practice area manager uh, for that company for 30 years and, and deep into sales and, and driving sales organizations. Uh, but <clears throat> for um, NFS, what I do is I lead the um, client engagement team, which is the sales organization, which is the, the conduit to the carriers in the space. Um, we also, um, I oversee the training and development organization, which is aligned to um, more than 70,000 potential agents out there that could potentially sell flood. And then I also have responsibility over the marketing department. And um, in marketing, um, we're doing um, things like brand awareness. Uh, we're doing flood education, both at an agent level and a consumer level. You know, as, as you're aware, Nick, um, this is, you know, coverage, you know, for flood for Americans is much of an education um, situation as it is an awareness situation. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, we do a lot of work um, just on awareness and education. Yeah. And, you know, it's, um, it's a tough conversation to have. Um, you talk to most agents or most brokers, and they struggle to have that conversation. So I I think it goes a little bit like this. I think it goes a little bit like, um, hey, have you considered flood insurance at all? Oh, I'm not in a flood zone. Right. And then there's like crickets, like the conversation kind of ends. And it's like when you talk about education, I'm thinking like everybody needs education. We as yes. professionals need education. The brokers and agents that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, they need education because – how else are we ultimately going to reach the property owner who ultimately needs to know that flood can happen anywhere, anytime? Correct. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a um, conversation that we have internally within our organization. You know, we, we as um, NFS have, you know, you know, feel some responsibility to make sure that, you know, coverage and awareness and, and education is adequately distributed across the country. Um, as you know, flood policies have a tendency to be bought or issued, you know, in the coastal communities. Um, but, you know, um, Midwest America and spring flooding, you know, I think there were 128 million people at risk of flooding just for the spring thaw. And, and where that happens is middle America, where people typically don't have those types of insurance products or their agents are not even approaching them, as you suggest, about flood, um, you know, and, you know, th those, those types of um, awareness campaigns, those types of um, uh, education opportunities that we have with agents, you know, are, are important to us. Yeah. And yeah. we try to take passive agents and convert them into active agents, yeah. you know, for, you for um, better about coverage. The, the 
the type of training slash education slash marketing that you're doing to um, kind of walk them through the process of um, one, you, you like, you must have these hard conversations with your customers sure. and here, here, um, what do you do to kind of help them bridge the gap to folks that just don't even want to listen to it? Sure. I mean, it's a, it's a great question. I think, you know, I kind of look at this as sort of an innovation opportunity or a three-legged stool. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, the first is um, consumer awareness, you know, to the potential policyholder. How do you get to um, the 300 plus million Americans to, you know, let them know that there is coverage available and everyone technically lives in a flood zone, right? Right. But most Americans think that they'll never experience flood because of where they live, right? Um, there's been some statistics that say, you know, if you have a 30-year mortgage, um, you're three times more likely to have a flood event than a fire event, right? But most people have home insurance, but not flood insurance. So that's an awareness um, at the consumer level, you know, to say that policies are relatively economic, you know, based on where you live. Um, they do supply um, ample coverage, and there's a lot of education around that your homeowner's insurance doesn't necessarily protect you from water coming over a foundation or surge and all those things that you could possibly get, not just in the coastal areas. Um, the second stool, um, leg of the stool, is, is really the it focused towards the agent. And, and Nick, you probably know this, that you know, of the 70,000 agents that we touch, there's a very small, a very small number of the agents that actually are you know, selling flood insurance and educated on flood insurance, like the 80-20 rule. 20% of the agents sell 80% of the policies. Um, so really, that's an awareness standpoint to help an agent. How would I approach a consumer? How would I approach a policyholder? How could I cross-sell my book? of business where I have clients that I could potentially reach, you know, for flood products. And then all that wrapped around on the third leg is technology platform innovation. You know, as a, as an insurance agent and as someone who sells insurance and maybe potentially flood insurance, selling flood is very complex, right? There's a lot to it. Um, we're building, you know, an end to end holistic platform that's cloud-based, that's intuitive, that essentially guides an agent through the process, you know, and, and leveraging, this is a very underserved part of insurance is the flood insurance space as it relates to technology innovation. So we're, we're really stepping up and, and, you know, putting our hat in that ring and saying, Hey, we, we need a platform that is facilitates or takes the complexity out of buying a flood policy. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, um, you know, what would what does a what does an interaction with NFS look like from an agent's perspective? Probably a lot of agents listening to this. Um, what what does that look like? How simple, streamlined, easy um, is it um, when, when they get on? Yeah, I mean it's 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 a it's a dynamic change to to what um, traditionally an agent experience might have been. With our, our new platform is called Trident. Um, we have approximately um, seven customers on the platform with about 6,000 agents actively um, logged in. We're going through a, um, a, a onboarding process with all our clients this, this um, calendar year. And really it's, 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 it's an intuitive type of application. It's a dynamic application process, meaning that you know, based on uh, the street address that you put in, uh, based on the profile of the house, um, there are, um, the application process is, is maybe five or six pieces of information to get you to maybe generate what we call a PRP policy, which is your basic standard policy based on your house type and <laughs> the zone you live in. Um, and then, you know, with that, um, it guides the agent through with pop-up videos, you know, with chat opportunities, you know, so really we're finding when agents are getting on the platform, there's not a lot of like educational material that we need to do, even though we onboard with education material, because the platform's so intuitive, they can maneuver themselves through uh, the process. Um, it allows them to upload information like, you know, elevation certificates, 
and some some of the other things that are required in issuing a flood policy. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And it's an end-to-end -end solution. It's, you know, we built it um, from an agent experience, but we also built it from, from a policyholder experience. We're looking at trying to reduce the days from first notice of loss to payment, you know, from, you know, your traditional maybe 30 days from a policyholder notifying about loss to check in the mail. You know, we think we can potentially take that in half with the new claims platform. Yeah. And, and really, it's all about serving, servicing the policyholder, which is important to the agent, of course, right, because it's, it's his or her reputation. Um, but it's also having an end-to-end -end intuitive program uh, where you as an agent could go in and manage your flood book with an agent dashboard, um, with alerts, and these are things yeah. that you still need to do to follow through or renewal. So really, it's, it's a really cool, neat um, platform that we believe is going to change the flood business. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because as you're as you're describing that, um, I had a conversation with Brian Falchuk, who's um, writing a book uh, called The Future of Insurance, talking about trying to understand your customer, and NFS through the Trident, you actually have two customers, right? Like right. You, as you just described, you have to uh, take care of the broker agent, and you have to take care of the actual policyholder, and there's an expectation for you to meet both of those. I don't think a lot of people understand like how challenging that is because the broker is more of the transact mentality. They kind of know what they want, but you're also you also need to educate them a little bit so that they can get to the policyholder, and the policyholder is looking to be taken care of. Right. You right. know. So there's right. there's a, a really hard balancing act when it comes to that. I don't think people understand the the complexities or the challenges when it comes to uh, uh, checking off both those boxes. Yeah. And I look at it too as, you know, sort of our obligation to the agent. You know, the agent is making his or her living by um, building these meaningful relationships okay. in these property and casualty lines. So they're building up a base of business and it's annuity based business. Um, and it's a generational business, right? It's something, you know, with my, you know, my agent and, you know, I've, I have a long-term history and, you know, one bad experience doesn't just affect the flood policy, it, it affects their whole book, potentially. So we take that very seriously. So the more we can do to get the customer, the policyholder engaged in the, in, you know, in, inside of, you know, to participate in the process and give them a good experience and make it easy and simplified, um, we're supporting that agent's reputation, but also taking care of the customer. At yeah. the same time, and that's really our obligation is to, and we take it seriously because we, you know, we we support the you know the you know we support FEMA and the NFIP product, and and um, you know the, there's there's there is there is a higher calling here when when there is a flood, um, there it's 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 usually you know it's there's there's a lot of anguish and pain and and things that are going on where you might be separated from your house and there's just a lot going on at that time too. So it's important that we have um, an approach that is very customer focused. Yeah. I, I, I view it Rick as an opportunity to um, think of it, you know, it comes down to dollars and cents, but I like, I like that generational aspect that you talked about. Mm -hmm. It's, I, I almost feel like I have an obligation to help the agent become an even bigger trusted advisor. Right. And try to walk them through, listen, um, the, you know, the risk for this property owner is higher. They're not in a flood zone, but it's higher than what they think it is. And if they do have a flood, it is almost a guarantee you're going to lose them as a customer, right? Yeah. If they don't have coverage. But right. Think of if they do have coverage. You're going to be a hero to them. So I almost, I enjoy having that conversation in a way to tell the agent, listen, this is a, this is a different way or a unique way for you to differentiate yourself where everyone's trying to get your homeowners or the auto or coming around and get the bot. If you can get them to buy the flood, then you'll still have access to all those things, but you're, you're going to differentiate yourself and you're going to come out smelling pretty good when that event does eventually occur. Sure. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I, I think that there's, there's value there to, um, um, 
be that trusted advisor, you know, and let them know that, you know, this, this additional product that they can procure or, or have, you know, in addition to the homeowners can, can mitigate any of that potential risk where something happens and whoop, my policy doesn't cover it, right? That's, that's, yeah, it's not a good situation for an agent to have. I believe that um, when Hurricane Harvey hit the Houston area, that 80%, first of all, it, when, when you hear Houston, you automatically start thinking like storm surge. Mm-hmm. That wasn't really Harvey. Harvey was a massive hurricane that got stuck and just right. like 50 inches of water. The water had no place to go. It was an inland flood event as those tributaries and other low-lying areas kind of filled up. I believe 80% of the properties that were damaged uh, were in a X zone. Yes. So they weren't actually technically in a flood zone yet. This was catastrophic flooding. Um, I'm curious, how often do you bring that that point up? Well, we do. I mean, we 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 bring up Harvey a lot as an example of the fact that, um, to your point, you know, that the, the the people and the homes that were affected are not where you think these homes w- yeah, would yeah. have been depend you know if you had your you know thinking about Houston potentially miles and miles away yeah. from the coast right so what happened yeah with that storm is that what you said what just what you said it got stuck it just it just it didn't move it hovered it was massive um, there was a tremendous amount of rain that happened over you know a long period of time and most of the homes that were affected were inland so we talk about um, you know the X zone is where people feel they're safe, right? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's one of the most inexpensive policies too to procure or to issue. Um, and and it's, it's something that I think that there, there's this whole mentality out here and I think we've, um, um, we've referenced the Harris poll a couple of times where you know, 62% of homeowners say that they're prepared for a flood, right? But only 12% have flood insurance. So to me, the, what does that tell me? Or what message am I getting from that? I'm getting the message I think through the homeowner is that I don't think I'm in risk. I'm in a, in a I'm at not at risk of flooding. So, you know, that's where the, you know, that's where the Harvey conversation comes up. That's where some of the spring flood conversation comes up. Um, you know, we had some, you know, some Michigan dams, you know, um, you know, that broke recently. We've had, um, you know, major rivers overflowing, you know, with, with certain things that have happened in the Midwest. And, you know, we've seen a lot of activity in terms of flooding, you know, in areas where you typically wouldn't see flooding, too. Uh, so, you know, those conversations come up mostly with the agents, you know, especially as we're looking at agents that maybe are less coastal-based and more Midwest-based. And, and, and we're, we're trying to, we're trying to, to educate and activate that group of agents that could potentially be the agents that might be the next generation of, of selling, you know, flood products, you know, to their, to their customers. Yeah. I I think of um, the earthen levees, um, Sacramento, uh, Missouri river, all, you know, all throughout the Midwest. I mean, there are thousands of miles of them all over the place and uh, you know, if those levees weren't there, that those would be flood zones, right? Right. So the levees, the only thing that's protecting them. And um, it's still tough having conversations um, about that because there's a, a false sense of security when mm-hmm. it comes to it. But that one seems easy, Rick. Like that one seems like a very easy conversation because if they're earthen levees, if they weren't there, everybody would agree that this would be a flood zone. These properties probably wouldn't don't deserve to be here in their earthen, right? Like, which means there is a lifespan. And now we have the Michigan Dam, which is the same earthen type of structure that Correct. failed. And it's like, um, I almost feel like our, oh, Rick, we're going to have like a constant bat, a marketing battle. Like right. just uh, Sisyphus trying to push the boulder up the hill, <laughs> up the mountain um, to have this conversation. But every new event is like another data point where it's just like, watch this video. Watch I'm uh, Elliott City, Maryland had two one in a thousand year floods within a five year stretch, and that's up on a hill. Right. 
You know, it's like, watch this video. It doesn't matter if you're up on a hill behind a levee in an area that's in an X zone um, or in a desert. Like when it does rain, the water has no place to go. It's, right. it's got to go somewhere. Right. Um, I, and I think, I, I think I, you uh, can. Good, good, please. I, just, I think you can, um, you know, so, some of the, some of the, you know, obviously social media has, has, has sent a message out, you know, maybe to a broader, you know, group of potential, um, whether it's consumer-based, direct-to-consumer information. I think, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, potentially a higher than normal storm season this year, yeah. right? Yeah. So we, you know, I think they're predicting maybe eight hurricane potential from a severity standpoint, maybe 16 um, tropical storms. And, uh, in, in, and there's, there's some evidence, as you're pointing out, there's some evidence, you know, environmentally that, you know, these things are becoming more frequent and more severe. Um, and I think that obviously we're not trying to um, um, use, you know, scare tactics or anything like that, but we're, you know, using some of that um, information that's being pushed out from a news coverage standpoint through social media, some awareness of the yeah, fact that yeah. that will be a more active season. And then, and then trying to associate that with certain things that have happened um, throughout the country, as you're pointing out, that are, you know, that you're, you're becoming a little bit more frequent that are more less traditional, um, you know, previously. So, you know, those things can potentially help with awareness and, and, and maybe start a conversation with the consumer, the policyholder, and the agent. We're trying to get the agent and the consumer to talk about this. Yeah. Uh, right. You, you mentioned that the NFS program is uh, part of uh, FEMA NFIP. Um, that's, that program has been changing over time. And are there, um, are there any benefits? Because uh, I, don't, I don't actually know the program like super well. I know yeah. the rudimentary details. But are there any benefits to um, someone buying coverage now um, because the program is going to change, you, you know, a lot of these more governmental programs grandfather and do things that are just like, um, you know, they, 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 prov it, it's like better to get it sooner rather than later. <laughs> sure. Can you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'll just quickly go, you know, so we've been, um, NFS has been around for 35 plus years. So we, we currently, um, manage about $1.8 billion of gross written premiums and about 1.4 million policies. Okay. Um, okay. And, and the, um, that's about 20% of the entire NFIP program. Yeah. It might be a little bigger actually. I mean, it, I, and, and I got that backwards. I'm sorry. $1.4 billion of gross written premium, 1.8 million policies. Yeah. yeah. yeah Significant. That's, I got it reversed because it's a little less than a thousand dollars per policy when you look on, on average in terms of your policy costs. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, you know, we're, we're, um, you know, we're a pretty substantial player, maybe a third of the marketplace uh, of policies that we're managing. Um, and the, um, so to your, to your point, um, th there's been changes, right? There's been changes in legislation. There's, there's changes in the arrangement with the carriers and with FEMA. Um, but I think one of the more interesting pieces and some of the reason that someone should start thinking about it is that, in my opinion, is that um, because the government underwrites the product, the product is somewhat monolithic, meaning that from a pricing standpoint, it's not priced like a traditional insurance mm -hmm. policy would be based on maybe where you're located, um, you know, what city you're in, you know, how old you are and, you know, all those types of things that are more actuarial service type situations. Uh, but the government's pretty close to um, putting in um, a program called risk rating 2.0, which is going to be um, the first step of actually um, setting the pricing for, a, for an insurance product based on where you live and your location, your street address and, it, and, it, and the risk. You know, uh, and and using that data, um, historical data, to be able to set policy cost. Yep. So, um, I mean, there's there's some, in my opinion, there's some opportunity now where where you know you get into the program. Um, there's a lot of grandfathering that goes on. 
as it relates to the way they change your flood zone determination, you know, where you're located. There's a, there's, a, there's a changing mapping system that goes on frequently um, as it relates to where you're located. Um, it continues to get better and better, you know, using technology, um, but um, they're, the program's changing and the program's improving. Does, uh, does NFS do anything around um, elevation certificates and flood zone determination? Yeah, we, we, do, support, um, um, we do support flood zone determination uh, for our agents and our carriers. So we, we provide that service um, uh, for our clients um, through the different types of um, product opportunities you have for flood zone de determination. There's guaranteed determination, there's non-guaranteed determination. There's different. What's the, different what's the difference? I don't. I don't. i uh, I didn't know those existed. What's the difference between the two? Well, the, the difference mainly is guaranteed, meaning that you're you're going to get um, a um, document back that says that you are precisely in this area from a street address standpoint, and you're precisely in this in this um, uh, flood zone, right? And then therefore I can now price your policy where, where there are other um, less expensive opportunities that people use or clients use or agent use that are sort of not guaranteed that they might be just sending out something to their clients to say, hey, if you're thinking of a flood um, policy and you're thinking of um, maybe procuring something or, or talking about it, you know, based on where you are, you know, this is the range of what we think the cost of your policy could be. Something similar that you might get from an insurance agent on other things, like um, yeah, sure. as it relates to coverage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I was I wasn't aware of that. I just know um, there it's a significant set of hurdles. I know you know I, I've uh, worked with agents and brokers who uh, have property owners that have been able to get their flood zone changed by having right. someone come out. Will risk rating 2.0 change that part of it? Um, do, do, do you, I, I'm, I'm not, it, it's, sounds like it would, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, I don't think that risk rating 2.0 will essentially change the determination of your flood zone. It will potentially change the cost of the policy, you know, based on it in conjunction with new mapping that is constantly being um, updated in terms of um, where you're located and what is considered a X zone compared to a different type of flood zone. So those, those things in conjunction will, will um, determine your flood policy and the cost of the policy. For those uh, property owners that have been grandfathered, will, be, will there be any changes to their status? That's hard to say. Because that that's the federal government, so political we, question. <laughs> we don't, yeah, we don't determine that. We follow, um, you know. There's there's been, um, you know, because of the COVID situation, um, what has happened with um, um, through the federal government and through FEMA, um, there's been a grace period for flood policies. So um, the federal government granted it 120 days um, for you as a policyholder to pay your policy within that 120 day period, even though it might have expired. So um, there's a, we're working inside of a grace period right now where um, because of the COVID situation, because of you know, some of the economics that we've witnessed, you know, the downturn in some of our financial markets and our, and our economics, um, economic markets, uh, we've, uh, the, go the government has given you know, this grace period in terms of paying um, and renewing for your policy. Um, so we are coming up to hurricane season. Uh, we yes. are in hurricane season. I get, get confused what day of the week it is and what day of the month uh, or what month it is. Uh, so we are in hurricane season. And I mean, just, I, I think you've kind of brought this up before. How important is it to just to have that conversation now? Um, do I'm assuming your product has a waiting period. Yes. So, like the yeah. conversation needs to happen now because we're going to be getting into the heat of the summer, the heat of the uh, hurricane season. And you don't want to get into a situation where a category five hurricane is bearing down 
you can go run and get a policy, but it's not going to kick in. Like, how important is it to have that conversation like today? Yeah, I think it's really important because there's a 30 day waiting period uh, for a policy to be yeah. issued. And, and it's and it's designed that way. Right. To say that, you know, with, you know, it it's designed to have um, a product that has a period of time. So the product just couldn't be procured, you know, the day before. Um, you know, a potential hurricane in terms of where, um, you, know, you know, where you're located. So there's a 30 day waiting period. Um, we're getting into the heat of, you know, the season. Um, we're, you know, we anticipate um, higher than normal activities um, as it relates to, um, you know, uh, tropical storms and hurricanes. So, you know, it's, in my opinion, this is, this is one of the busy, busier periods for new business too on top of it. Nick, so when you look at our business cyclic, you know, on a cyclical basis, um, as we move into May, June, July, August, September, we our new business numbers go up, you know, pretty, you know, not they don't double or they're not, but but there's a spike, right? Because because of the awareness and 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 some of the work that the agents do out with with their clients, um, we have. So I think. That this particular moment in time, it's a really important time to have that conversation, at least from a policyholder standpoint or a potential homeowner, they can make a decision yeah. on yeah. if, you know, the policy cost and the coverage and, and, and what they can leverage by having that flood policy makes sense for them. Yeah. yeah. Um, any um, projections? I'll give you mine if you want to share yours. Um, I, I, I want to like entice brokers to get excited about this and I'm, you know, I, I'm kind of telling them from my expectations on what I'm seeing and I, I think the marketing's starting to take hold, Rick. My expectations are this market's going to double or triple in the next five years. Like we're going to get a lot of folks that uh, prior would never have considered flood yeah. to buy it. And I'm telling brokers to jump in because like now's a really good chance to get some a access to premiums. So have those conversations now. Do you or does NFS sort of project out like where they think the flood market's going to be in the next five or 10 years? Well, I think personally, um, you know, the reason the reason I came came here, you know, in January, um, one of the reasons I should say there are a lot of reasons I came here, but. Because you're doing um, God's I mean, work, Rick. Come on. Yeah, I was, you know, I was with the same company for 30 years, so it wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't really looking to, to move. But um, after doing the research, you know, in terms of in terms of the coverage, and if you look at the coverage in this country, um, you know, it might start in Texas and wrap its way around to New Jersey, right, coastal. So if you built a heat map of where the policies are, yeah. policies live in a pretty particularly small area of the country. Um, I'm a proponent of doubling. I believe the, the coverage could easily double in the next three years. And I, and I think the reason that um, we're making all the technology investments we are and making flood simple, you know, we our, our slogan is flood ought to be simple um, and making all the technology investments and making the educational investments uh, you know, we believe that we could potentially double coverage in three years. Now, I think there's a lot of opportunity to Nick with private product. Um, you know, you have your traditional NFIP product, you have a lot of different private product offerings. I think in combination, if the market has selection and the selection makes sense and it's easy to procure and easy to understand as a homeowner, um, then the, then the potential to triple coverage is there too. Yeah. So yeah. You know, we're, we're in that, we're in that boat. We have, we feel the responsibility. We're making the investments because we think the market is poised to grow. I don't know if you know, is, does Trident have the capability of going direct to consumer? Does NFS do any of that? Um, currently we don't. Um, the, um, but we definitely, the, we definitely believe that the, Future is a direct to consumer model okay. and a direct to agent, meaning a multi multiple channel approach. So we do some direct to consumer work. So I don't want to say no. For some of our clients, we have built out direct to consumer sites 
um, where their clients could um, have a branded um, experience with their carrier, but you know, essentially we're the backbone you know, to the procurement process and the policy administration and the claim work. Um, but yeah, Trident will, is built and designed to have a direct to consumer um, focus and portal. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Uh, Rick Tai, thank you so much for coming on, talking about my topic close to my heart. Um, I will have all of your contact information um, on the show notes. So anyone that's listening, uh, you don't have to pull over and or whatever. Just go to the show notes. The transcript will be there. And um, Rick, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Uh, for everyone that's listening, uh, we're not over this yet. I keep hearing about a second wave. Keep safe. Wash your hands. Uh, practice your social distancing, and let's all be good to one another. Um, and once again, Rick, thank you. Thank you. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Yeah.